everybody. Uh, it's a great pleasure to introduce Dr. Troy Innocent, who uh, was, used to be a martyr five years ago, I think, and moved to Swinburne and set up a uh, games design course there, which has been hugely successful, and um, produces graduates who make independent games. Uh, and Troy's um, a really well-known Australian practicing media artist. He's been involved in that area for many, many years. Figure on it, but 20, 25, yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> um, and he does really amazing, unique work, and he's been very generous to come and talk to us about it today. So please join me in welcoming Troy. Thank you, Troy. Yeah, thanks, uh, John and Tom, for the invitation to uh, come and speak. Um, I'll be talking about my uh, live gaming practice, which takes place in, in urban environments. I'm going to kind of talk for probably, try and keep it down to 30 minutes or so, um, and just throw in a whole lot of, a whole lot of different ideas because this um, uh, kind of research, like a lot of practice-based research, is very iterative. It's very much um, a, a case of you know, staging these experiments in cities, um, seeing what happens, and then kind of coming up with the next kind of iteration of, of, of the idea, which I've been doing for the past probably five years or so. Well, actually, the first game was in 2010 in the city of Melbourne, and the last game was just a, a month ago, also in the city of Melbourne, so there's kind of definite kind of progression, and I might talk about that a little uh, today uh, as well. Um, but I'm just going to start by framing the idea or the motivation behind making these experiences. And it's really summed up by um, uh, this, this idea of finding ways of being. Um, so. Over the kind of last decade or so, my practice has shifted from being largely concerned with um, semiotics, that is, you know, the study of you know signs and symbols and how you know language is con constructed, and I'm still very much interested in that. But it's shifted more into the kind of uh, uh, kind of um, uh, context of phenomenology, that is, looking at how um, hybrid kind of systems or, or kind of di kind of digital media ecologies um, create these experiences for people when they encounter those and when they come into contact with people and machines and and um, you know the city can be seen as a machine in a, in a lot of ways um, you know new forms of being arise from that so we're really interested in, in kind of looking at or kind of not only looking but kind of trying to understand or come to terms with with what is, what happens in those urban spaces and so a lot of these games while they're playful and they're Kind of dealing with kind of themes sometimes around urban planning, sometimes around um, uh, wayfinding, which is kind of a, a kind of a major theme. Um, they're also about this kind of situating people in, in a particular context and, and kind of trying to really open up. And this is the kind of primary idea, um, which is really uh, kind of why I'm working with games, um, is trying to open up the world reality. As, as not something that's kind of seen as fixed, but something that is rather fluid and, and mutable. So that is kind of this idea of um, taking kind of the world around you and re-ontologizing it. That is kind of giving you meaning to it. Taking, for example, a, a city street and, and kind of through some kind of digital um, intervention, shifting the meaning of that, bringing it into a game world. And so that's what I'm really kind of talking about when I'm, when I'm talking about wayfinding, is not so much, you know, Kind of finding which gate you need to get get, get to, to to catch a flight, um, which is you know, what we use wayfinding systems all the time. But this more abstract idea of wayfinding of, of actually finding ways of being. Um, but coming back to where I started from, these experiences do use overt systems of signs and symbols. Um, so there's a kind of a mixture of of these different strategies. So to give you some um, kind of grounding or, or, or kind of context of what I'm, what I'm talking about, because that's a whole bunch of really abstract ideas, um, this is what it actually involves. These are uh, what I call urban codes. And so I've been making these for the last five or six years. And they're physical objects that can be attached to you know, walls, um, signs, um, pretty much anywhere. Uh, and um, they have a number of different um, kind of uh, functions. Uh, and that's one thing that I'm really interested in thematically is the multiplicity of meaning because they, you know, at one level they can be read as abstract artworks, um, but they also operate as uh, often as fiducial markers. That is, kind of, um, you know, they can be read by you know, uh, augmented reality software using you know, machine vision type structures, so uh, systems rather, 
um, and then activate digital content. So they kind of then uh, have this um, other other function. And that's one thing I'm really interested in is that different readings of, of these objects, both by humans and machines, and that comes through in the work uh, uh, a fair bit. These images, incidentally, I'm not going to talk about all of the works in, the, in this body of research, but I will um, kind of mention a few and go into two in, in depth uh, towards the end. But this is a a work that I did um, uh, in uh, uh, collaboration with Vince Eakin, um, uh, uh, where he kind of is interested in kind of research around museums and, and, and um, kind of different ways to, to situate content. Uh, in this uh, project, um, he made available the um, Museum of Victoria's Field Guide app. Um, so we were able to recontextualize that field guide experience and, and give kind of like short entries, um, which you might be able to read just that one on the, on the, right, on the right there, uh, of these urban codes. So rather than just being abstract objects, they're you know, identified as, as some kind of media creatures that are living around the city. Uh, and so in this case, um, you use the field guide to locate them and, and read these short stories uh, about them. So that's one example of how the urban codes are used in, a, in, in this case, a narrative uh, kind of context. Here is um, uh, so kind of you know asking this question um, of you know what is an urban code you know why make these things and here's this kind of idea of multiplicity that I'm talking about so um, any particular one of these objects um, and over the last, uh, over the various projects have you know produced thousands of them um, they have any any one of these meanings and some of them have all seven of these meanings so they you know first of all first of all well actually there's no order here there's there's, there's I'll, I'll go through them in order, but they, these, these meanings have kind of equal value. It's a kind of flat ontology. Uh, so um, they, they're kind of signifiers of an alternate world. So if somebody sees one of these, they're oh, you know, what is this? You know? um, and once they come to realize that, that it's part of this you know, game world, they say, oh, that's part of that game world that's you know, embedded in the city. Uh, in many cases, they're collectible game tokens. So they, they you know, have a really kind of functional um, uh, pur kind of uh, purpose in that they uh, produce points or resources that players can use in a game. Uh, they're wayfinding markers, so you know they, they demarcate the, the, the bounds of, of a game world in a city. So you say, well, okay, I saw one of those on Flinders Street, I saw another one on Elizabeth Street, so I know the game is in between these two spaces at least, and I find another one, then I start to triangulate the space. Like I said, they're machine codes or fiducial markers. They're material objects, so they um, quite deliberate kind of uh, strategies for construction here. So, I mean, you could, uh, um, well, here we have some right here. You could um, <laughs> use things like this, uh, just uh, kind of the traditional black and white um, uh, markers, which work just, just as well, but I'm really interested in the materiality of these as, as objects, uh, as well as their kind of function as um, fiducial markers. Um, they're also, in terms of their design, um, uh, reference the, the, the history of abstract art, particularly geometric um, abstraction or kind of formalism. Um, and in many cases, they're connected to, to musical notes. So there's this kind of synesthetic element as well, and each kind of plays a, a note or a musical phrase. And so they're used to construct um, compositions. Um, so they have all of these possible meanings. And that's something that I'm really interested in is that, that multiplicity. And you know, like I was saying at the beginning about setting up a system, putting that system in contact with a, a complex environment like a city um, and then allowing people to, to interact with that um, within the framework of a game which provides you know, some boundaries or some kind of constraints on, on what people, what are meaningful uh, actions within that world um, and then seeing what arises from that, that those, those processes or those things in play. Um, so just to give some context where this idea uh, came from, I mean cities are already full of codes and so this is really just a kind of way to formalize that if you start looking at cities you'll find all kinds of um, uh, you know sometimes quite overt sometimes quite hidden codes and um, uh, 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 kind of there's also some historical precedents here in the um, uh, uh, the kind of the, the, the transient culture that that that, that, that um, emerged in the, the, the US during the Great Depression um, developed uh, quite um, spontaneously and it was kind of emergent language I guess in a lot of ways this um, system of chalk and, and engraved codes which would, were used by hobos to um, identify places where they could get food or where there was danger and, and things like this so this idea of you know, hidden codes or embedding language in, in urban environments um, things that are put there not by you know 
the 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 the, the, uh, the council or, or the, the kind of um, the the you know, commercial interests or whoever else kind of has a uh, a kind of so-called traditional you know, position of power in that space. Um, uh, this is you know, very much an influence, and obviously Melbourne is a great place to do this uh, kind of uh, thing because there's a, you know, a tradition of street art which does exactly that, inscribe new meanings into into cities. Um, and quite ironically, and I might get to talk to this uh, kind of later, that's become now you know, part of the mainstream kind of formal um, language of, of Melbourne, so it's not as subversive as, as it once was. So here's some images from a couple of events. Um, uh, you, John, you may recognise some former PhD students in the mix uh, there, yeah. who have volunteered <laughs> on various uh, events. But um, uh, all, um, and so this is the first event, which which was literally called Urban Code Makers, um, but and uh, where we, we 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 staged a game, which is an alternate reality game. It ran for for five months. Um, which kind of looked at this theme of what, what if urban planners um, were game designers? You know, what if you redesigned the city through through play? And so, it kind of po kind of posed that question. Uh, and to to spark off the um, narrative, we staged a, a, a demonstration which was based on the premise that the city of Melbourne had shut down all play in public space, just to open up that idea of you know well, you know who's who who um, owns this space and what is possible to do in this space and I'm really very much interested not only in this um, kind of aspect of, 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 of play and, and um, you know kind of recreating reality and so forth but also the subversive nature of play and how it appropriates and, and changes space just through its through its presence or through the action of, of, of people the occupation of space I also started working with um, uh, uh, Inde uh, Huang, who's not here today, but said he'd like to be here, is uh, installing a work overseas um, on augmented reality work. So this is one of the first one of the first of those called Noma Flux, which we um, uh, developed in Ogaki in Japan um, as part of a, a residency. And so we we're able to kind of start looking at this. This and, and this is where a lot of this research started. Is you know we had these kind of low tech, you know, really physical codes, but then we had these, um, you know, kind of, uh, kind of digital codes that were being read by, by systems and slowly those two kind of threads have, have, have come together through a series of experiments. Um, uh, but the, the, the idea also is that rather than just put objects out into the world, um, there is something of a life that comes with them. And so all of these different experiments and, and um, uh, kind of situations uh, also uh, kind of located within a context which is, um, I'm not going to talk about this research today, but I've also been doing research on micronations. I've visited several around the world um, and the idea is with this, with this kind of context here is, a, is a kind of like a micronation which is um, uh, situated in play. So it doesn't have a physical location but it has a kind of, I guess, a, um, a phenomenological location that is when you're in play you're in the micronation of Ludea. Um, and uh, it's, it's, it's just kind of like a, a, a contextual kind of um, shift that allows this other space to come into being. So a lot of the people you see in, in various overalls and, and uh, uh, kind of uh, and so forth are, are kind of uh, representatives of this micronation. So the other kind of, kind of idea in terms of reinventing reality, I'm kind of interested in this idea of alternate reality games which were very popular in the first decade of this millennium. Um, and in fact, this year, I think we're kind of living in one. It's the, the kind of year of, of, of post-truth and it's really hard now to see the difference between kind of alternate reality gaming from, from the early uh, kind of part of this century to what's actually happening in um, lived reality at the moment. Um, but they, they kind of play with, with what, is, what is fact and what is fiction, but presenting these ideas in the context of, of actual reality so that there's not a, there's no kind of um, uh, border between when the game ends and when it kind of stops, you're in it all the time. And so you're constantly kind of questioning what is real and what is not. Um, so th this micronation of Ludea serves to also s kind of build something of that context in into the experience. Um, most recently, especially uh, kind of this year, I've been really interested in this idea of urban code making as wayfinding um, in that really uh, abstract sense that I was, I was talking about. Uh, and so um, here we have, you know, wayfinding. Uh, I'm going to go into this um, in a little bit of detail because it kind of informs the two projects I wanted to kind of touch on. Um, 
Yeah, in this, in this case, like I was saying at the beginning, wayfinding is um, more about you know, finding ways of being um, rather than finding a location. So even though you're traversing different locations, the goal of these uh, experiences is to uh, take the player into a, a state in which they start to um, see the world differently. And that is the kind of main uh, goal. They start to see the world in a way in which it, it can be kind of reinvented or reinscribed. And there's a lot of historical precedents to this, which um, I, I probably won't go into today, but I will kind of just mention, which is one is the Situationist International, um, who had several projects, um, such as you know, the, the idea of the, the drift or the, the, the drift, urban drift, you know, moving through space and just observing things, building your own psychogeography. Even though that idea in a lot of ways has been appropriated by um, uh, you know, the ways that we see cities now. So for example, a really subversive reading of, of Paris um, uh, at the time that this was, was, was taking place might have uh, used you know, odd cafes and bits of street art and graffiti and so forth to, to create this reading. But now, of course, you know, all of that, 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 that stuff is now embedded in, in the commercial kind of lived reality of, of the city, uh, especially in a city like Melbourne, which, which kind of really pushes that stuff to the foreground. So you have to look to other places for, for that type of psychogeography. And where, where urban code making looks to the infrastructure of the city, the kind of underlying systems, you know, the things that we kind of sometimes uh, sort of call, call smart cities, uh, the, the kind of layers of the city that, that, that um, smart cities deal with. Um, and so the other, the other point of reference is the new games movement, which was in, uh, arrived, uh, kind of uh, um, came into play in the 70s, um, largely as a reaction to uh, uh, political events in the US, such as the Vietnam War. And they, the um, goal there was to, to see play not as a competitive activity, but as a collaborative um, community building activity. Uh, and so this is um, when we're kind of talking about things such as serious games and so forth. There, there is a power to play um, in connecting people with urban space and with, with, with I guess, one another in a play experience. Um, but it, it has its roots in a kind of subversive uh, action that is to, you know, ask people to, to do something different and to occupy space differently and to think and see the world differently. And so I guess um, as much as it's possible to do so in this particular point in time where all of these things are contested and uh, you know being appropriated uh, in so many ways, um, that is still the core to this uh, kind of experience is those, those kind of motivations, motivations that the situationists and the you know, our founders of the New Games movement had, which was to use play to appropriate and occupy space in different ways. So quite literally, it's, um, you know, like I said, uh, from a phenomenological perspective, you know, looking at situa this, this kind of si the, the situational context of being in the world, and so finding ways of being. What that means, and this is kind of where we go a bit phenomenologically, phenomenology 101, um, it's hard to say after three coffees, um, is um, really this kind of core concept of, of um, uh, you know, uh, Zuhandenheit and Vorhandenheit, which is, um, you know, the, the, the kind of famous example is, is when you, you're using a, a, a hammer, um, you don't think of yourself as using a hammer, the hammer becomes part of you. Uh, and so your, your, the kind of tool becomes part of your body. So in terms of applying this to a kind of wayfinding or an urban code making context, the idea is that the system you know, becomes part of your way of being in the world and therefore enables this other, through play, this other kind of engagement. <coughs> so to, to kind of really put that in, in a uh, uh, kind of overt context, so um, instead of kind of moving around the city saying, I think this is the right way, I'm going the right way, I see the signs, you know, kind of following this particular path, it's more, I feel this is the right way. So you're in that kind of um, moment of, of, of engagement. So um, wayfinding uh, as a strategy in contemporary cities has um, all of these layers to it. So I'll kind of talk now a little bit about the, the way that these kind of systems kind of work. So the, the urban codes and the way they kind of connect to, to a game system, the way they also um, locate players. And so this is where um, some of the current research um, that I'm moving into is looking at overlaps between this and, and, and the kind of idea of playable cities, which is connected to the I think somewhat contentious idea of smart cities um, that can be somewhat uh, uh, and, and kind of challenging that really super functional efficient concept of the smart city and, and saying well okay 
that's good if you're a machine, but what if you're a human and you know, maybe playable cities is a kind of good compromise between these two layers? Because it built into a lot of these um, games are all of the, the kind of things that we expect to see in, in a kind of smart city uh, uh, kind of in, in, in infrastructure, such as locating people, um, tracking flows of movement through urban space and all of those kinds of things. Um, and this all happens, like I was saying, through the phenomenological experience of the player. So here are some you know, people engaged in play, um, different modes of interaction. Um, this is in Adelaide where um, you know, they're using a digital system. This is a player in Sydney uh, who has collected all of these objects. And, and um, I, I won't go into it now, but I wrote with a, 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 with a colleague. Um, I, I wrote a, a, a paper on these different levels of player experience, if you're interested in this aspect of it, which we um, analysed three different player experiences. This particular player, um, whose uh, name was Olga Polga, I think, um, in, the, um, in the game world, uh, no, Faux Polga, um, uh, uh, kind of described an experience which was closest to what I you know, have aspired to create for the players, in which she kind of lost track of, of the world around her and just saw codes, and so much so that she was walking through a park and she was actually standing in front of someone, kind of scanning them, um, and, and then she, you know, kind of flipped back into to, um, uh, the kind of day-to-day -day kind of world and realised, oh, there's a person there, and kind of got embarrassed and walked away, but she was so kind of keyed into a particular way of seeing, a way of being, that she kind of lost, lost the sense of, of um, you know, the, the usual mode of perception that she would use to engage with the world. Um, it's also uh, because I'm, I'm a uh, you know, artist, designer, um, uh, this, this is a, a, also a methodology for pervasive game design. So I haven't talked a lot about pervasive game design, but this is a, a form of practice that is really, um, I mean, it's, it's, it's not new, because New Games Movement was doing this, the Situationists were doing this, and of course play, if you go right back to its origins, was non-digital, but um, the last couple of decades, um, the idea of, you know, games that aren't purely digital is like, well, this is a new thing. So. Um, so this is the methodology for that type of game design, which is what, essentially what pervasive game design is, um, involving the game in the real world. The kinds of actions that players are kind of taking, uh, are undertaking when they're playing these games are searching, collecting, scoring. So there's a kind of really mechanical, um, uh, kind of purpose-driven actions uh, that they're engaged in. But they're also kind of engaged in these more playful actions. And in terms of um, uh, game studies, um, so we've also kind of looked at this research from the point of view of, of, of how it fits with game studies. There's a tension between games and play. So, you know, games being the more kind of often uh, competitive, uh, kind of measured and uh, kind of, um, uh, of process-driven uh, um, uh, and kind of uh, uh, systems and those things that are more open-ended and more playful. So, and there's not necessarily goal-orientated, um, which is, uh, and so there's also those actions which are more playful about, you know, what is the world and how do we encounter it and so forth. Um, so these, these more playful actions come into, into, into the mix. And of course, that manifests also in this um, idea of you know seeing, interacting, Im and imagining. So kind of seeing the world in different ways, which is really, like I said, like I started with, the primary goal of these experiences, and that comes about through all different kind of um, uh, uh, processes, through physical presence, through renaming locations, through um, you know the alternate reality, and so forth. So I've talked also a lot about. Um, Appropriation. So I'm going to just kind of uh, define that a little more um, because it's really important in connection with this idea of play. So we know appropriation. Um, there's a long, well, you know, at least a century uh, of history in, of, of this in in in, in art practice, uh, where we you know we take one thing, we put it into a new context, and we make it another. Um, games and particularly kind of playful encounters are, are particularly good at this. Uh, so you can take a location, um, you can play a game there, and the, the location is transformed through that play. Not only for the people playing the game, but also for anyone that observes it, because, oh, that space is now, you're operating differently. Um, and uh, so, uh, in terms of the urban code making practice, the idea really is to, to look at this kind of concept of ready-made level design. So taking a city, uh, an urban space, and through the action of, of tagging it with these various urban codes, it becomes 
a ready-made game. The, the, it's a ready-made level of, of a game. Um, and so this uh, has, has a number of effects. One is to appropriate that space, and then it becomes not, not only a space, but a, a, a place in the context of, of the uh, game world. Uh, and it also kind of serves to um, humanize it in a lot of ways, because um, uh, instead of it being this you know, kind of uh, you know, formal system of, of street names and codes and locations and demarcation of zones and things like that, um, it has, it's become something else. It's like, oh, this, this city could be another thing, um, which is really important. So I'll talk about some examples now. Um, and I'll go through these fairly quickly because I want to get to um, time for questions or discussion uh, um, uh, on, on, on these projects or, 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 or any of the topics I've been talking about, if, if you want me to go into more depth. Um, but first, I'll go through a couple of examples. Like I said, these are both produced this year. This one is um, uh, uh, Zoncon, which is a play on the name Hong Kong, uh, which I produced in collaboration with Hugh Davies for ISEA, um, which was in Hong Kong this year uh, in um, April, May. And um, the concept with this was to use all the systems I've been talking about, um, but to apply them to, I guess, in some ways, a, a serious game context in that um, what we wanted to explore was the, the trade history of Hong Kong. So how did this city come to be? And well, I mean, it's, and it's also constantly in a process of becoming. Um, it's, uh, it still is and will continue to be for, for quite, uh, for the foreseeable future, a major kind of trade center in the world. And so really trade defines this city. Um, so even, you know, uh, so uh, the, you know, the, I mean, the structure of the city is, is partly due to its, you know, kind of, you know, constrained space and, and so forth, but also due to the, the kind of um, concentration of people there who are you know, there to uh, engage with free trade and all the other kind of opportunities that that space affords, which is why you know, there's such dense, um, dense uh, kind of densely populated kind of zone, um, the most densely populated zone in the world, in fact. So we came up with a game, game system that used a lot of these uh, kind of uh, processes and QR codes, um, we never used them in Australia, but in Hong Kong, they have currency. Um, so uh, we, used, we developed a system uh, which allowed um, players to go out and, and drew, kind of drew them to various locations around Hong Kong um, that uh, were you know, connected to, to the trade history. You know, so this is a symbol for opium, for example. Um, we also had you know, other resources like tea and silk and electronics and so forth. And people would scan the code and collect resources. So they would collect you know, one token of opium. They were then kind of able to take that to an actual um, kind of well, a model city in the gallery space and trade it for these kind of um, uh, tokens that you would allow you to build uh, quite literally uh, a, 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 a kind of location in Zoncon. So you'd start to kind of, and there's a kind of tension here because once you invested in a token, you no longer had that um, resource to um, play with on the, on the trade kind of, a, kind of a ex the, the stock exchange where you could kind of trade these resources. So for example, you might have collected three opium one day, the next day you find out that you can you know, trade you know, that opium for six silver. So you're able to you know, kind of, you know, you say, oh, I should have held onto that opium and sold it because you know, um, rather than invested in the building. Um, so there's all these kind of simple, um, very simple kind of trade mechanics um, uh, from you know, kind of resource uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, kind of getting, getting kind of resource building games um, that play into this, and so um, by the end of the the, the game, the, the kind of uh, we, uh, I won't go into all the mechanics, but you're able to take over people's towers online, and you're able to kind of trade with with people in the gallery, and do all of these kinds of things to either collaborate or individually um, build the tallest tower in Zoncon um, to to win the game. We, didn't, we never stated that overtly as the goal of the game, but once people were in play, they realized that, well, if I want to win this, and not everyone wanted to win, um, so that's a kind of another interesting kind of tension in, 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 the, in the process, um, I've got to build the tallest tower, so how do I do that? Um, more recent kind of project, which um, was part of Melbourne International Games Week, uh, um, uh, just, a, just a, I think three weeks ago, still recovering, um, was Wayfinder Alive, which um, put into play a lot of those kind of concepts I was just talking about in terms of you know setting up a wayfinding experience, quite um, uh, kind of ex kind of explicit wayfinding experience. 
quite so th so in this game it was a very much about um, finding uh, the, the markers around the city of Melbourne um, it was only ran for 10 days um, which was the duration of Melbourne International Games Week uh, this one was playable by a downloadable app which um, just from a kind of I guess a technical or a design point of view allowed a lot of kind of uh, uh, more opportunities for I guess um, uh, directing the player experience or making um, uh, <coughs> opening up the player experience to, to lots of possibilities. The, the, the concept in, in this game was that the um, uh, you know, fragments of, of a micronation, so the micronation of Ludea, are, are floating around the city, so you kind of have to find those um, and unlock um, them on the map to be able to complete the, um, the game and become a citizen. So here is, the, you can see on the, the right hand side the map with um, uh, I think four or five, maybe six pieces unlocked. Um, and uh, you, so the goal was to kind of collect all, all 16 of these. So it was used as a very, very simple treasure hunt mechanic, um, but there's a couple of other layers uh, to it as well. When you encountered um, these various uh, kind of pieces of the puzzle, um, the, there was very, the, the very simple clues. In fact, um, I wanted to make the clues harder, but in, the, in our play testing, we found you know, people were, there was about hundred different things on as part of Games Week, so we had to make them really simple. Um, so it says, you know, pretty much tells you where it is. <laughs> um, but um, came up with all these really poetic clues, but um, I can't figure this out. Um, so this is an, a kind of interesting thing, I guess, as well, in terms of, you know, the motivation of players, um, you know, making it kind of accessible to them. When you, when you found these loca locations, there was an animated display and some sounds, um, and um, also linked back to that project I showed um, first, first of all, which was talking about these in terms of um, their, their role in some kind of a, a ecology. Uh, when the, the game that you played after this, um, in terms of once you collected these um, tokens was, so there was the wayfinding experience that took you through all these different locations and um, you, you encountered things along the way and started to look at the city differently because you started to key yourself into these codes. Um, but you're also connecting, collecting tokens um, that you could use to, to invest in your a particular faction and so there were three different factions um, one was to you know kind of revert the city back to a state of nature second was to renew it as it was the third was to re remake it as some kind of technological utopia slash dystopia um, interestingly the remake the dystopian slash utopian um, objective was really popular at the start uh, but in the end renew kind of won out so kind of status quo was the was the outcome of the game um, but you were able to kind of influence locations. And this is where it became a multiplayer game. So while the individual kind of wayfinding experience, you walking around, collect, kind of collecting these codes, you were then kind of investing or, um, tokens into, into locations to, to claim them for your faction. And so there's this kind of process you can see here on the left of, 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 of um, kind of taking ownership. And so the, the, at the end of the game, it was the, the map was constantly flickering between um, orange and blue as those two kind of factions um, kind of played out the, the, the final outcome of the game. Um, so, so that was the, the kind of uh, uh, experience was these, these two kind of two levels, the immediate wayfinding and then the kind of community building afterwards um, of, of people playing together. Okay, so just to finish up, I was wanting to kind of put some, uh, I guess, questions or kind of pose some kind of um, uh, ideas that that come out of this, or you know, kind of unresolved um, ideas, but still, I think that that, that come out of this type of work, which um, uh, uh, kind of interesting to reflect on in the context of, of, of wayfinding and uh, urban space, and what what we do in those spaces. Um, and so, the first one of those is really kind of tied to this idea of micronations, which is um, you know, do rituals of play in public space enable new ways of being? And so this is, you know, this is the, the, the goal of a lot of this work. Um, but it's still, you know, kind of, how, how do you measure that? How do you kind of, um, uh, kind of un understand that? And what, what other strategies could be put in place um, to, to make that happen? Um, so one assertion, this comes from game studies, is that play creates culture. Um, and so, if, if that is, um, if we kind of take that to be true, then how are play and culture intrinsically linked? You know, how does play produce culture? Um, and so one of the ideas around this is that, you know, play is a kind of a, a free space in which you can explore possibilities that perhaps don't always have consequence in the real world, but that it, it is kind of a, a kind of 
linking to the first point, um, uh, a ritual forming, habit forming, kind of process forming activity uh, and, and the things that arise in play can harden into culture afterwards um, if they're kind of seen as viable or if you know, a community ad adapts them. And this is not always a, a conscious decision making process, which is what's really interesting about it. Um, does the concept of the ready-made apply to placemaking? So you know, what other kind of ways can we look at that idea of taking a place and just appropriating it into, um, sorry, taking a space and appropriating it into a, a kind of new place? Um, and so urban codes are geolocation markers. Uh, can the process of urban code making decode a city? So one of the ideas I'm really interested in, and this is you know, connected to this contentious idea of smart cities, is that you can decode the infrastructure of a city, um, perhaps hack it in some ways through urban code making. So you start to kind of find um, those and un uh, kind of uncover and decode those hidden layers of whether it's as simple as you know finding free Wi-Fi or, or something more complicated, uh, com complex um, goal. Uh, and finally, can um, alternative realities activate the mythic in the everyday? So. Um, you know, linking back to the, the early days of my art practice, one of the things that's always drawn me to um, digital media uh, is, is that kind of possibility of, 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 of creating um, alternate worlds or other, other, other worlds in which you know, possibilities outside the everyday um, become uh, uh, you know, um, tangible. Uh, and so you know, situating this work in the everyday, the day-to-day -day life of a city, you know, can we bring that kind of uh, idea of possibility back into into everyday kind of life. Thank you. So we have some time for questions for Troy. Want to just kick off? Yeah. Um, so really, really interesting stuff. Like really keen on this kind of stuff. Um, Cheers. But. Um, I, I really like that all of the stuff you showed had a kind of tangible, physical element to, like, whether it's just like a piece that is physically placed somewhere or something that you can collect or something. Um, we've seen, like, Ingress and Pokemon Go are the two big AR games where they don't, they couldn't, for the scale of those games, rely on a physical marker. I'm just wondering what you think the benefits or, like, comparing a game that's purely digital but still location-based to something that has a more physical component, um, what, do you what do you think the benefits are of that physical component over just something that's on a screen? Yeah, sure. So, I mean, yeah, it is that, that tangi tangible sense of, yeah. of, um, of presence, which is really tied to that idea of, you know, um, phenom phenomenological experience. Um, I guess, you know, working in, in the context that I do, I don't have the same constraints that, um, uh, you know, the designers of Pokemon Go have and, and pretty much, I think I've done six maybe presentations on this this year and er everyone's <laughs> yeah, everyone yeah. mentions yeah. Pokemon Go Cause, and, I, and I play it because, um, uh, and I played Ingress before that in Shadow Cities as well. Um, and so in, in comparing those experiences, um, I mean, they, they do try to, to take the space and turn it into a game. And so there are, there are ways that, that, that they, they connect to real spaces. So for example, Ingress and Shadow Cities would, you know, um, and, and Pokemon Go does this as well with the gyms, um, connect to, to real world locations that you have, you know, and the, you know, all of the mechanics I'm using like treasure hunts, factions, all those kinds of things are common to this type of, of, of gameplay because, because they work as a, as a structure. So they, they so all of these games have those those things built into them. Um, in Pokemon Go, um, they they tried the you know AR function, so you can see Pokemon yeah. you know, located yeah. next to things, which which I think um, uh, was a, was really good in terms of um, normalizing the idea of augmented reality and making it you know something that isn't just this weird technology. So it made it kind of popularized. It I guess is a better word. Um, but it still has, the, because the, um, uh, yeah, the, the system has no real understanding of where the virtual objects are, it's quite kind of problematic and I know for a fact from observing my students playing it that anyone who is, you know, kind of just trying to level up in the game just turns that off because it's, you know, a distraction. 
But then, you know, it's interesting, uh, kind of the other side to that is, you know, people post all these photographs of, oh, you know, there's a, there's a pigeon on your head, or this, yeah, all that kind of stuff, which is, you know, quite playful in itself. And the game designers didn't put that into the game. It's, you know, something that, you know, kind of just, just um, I mean, I'm sure they, they expected that to happen, but that's interesting aside. Um, but for me, um, uh, I mean, this is also probably kind of from where I've come from as well, is that um, for me, uh, uh, I guess, um, starting out in media art in the 90s, where there really was a very much a kind of a, a focus on the virtual and, and this idea of, you know, kind of, you know, intang things that are intangible or digital, or that, that kind of uh, thing. I'm still artistically trying to reconcile that with physical, you know, material world. And so that's, for me, one of the really interesting things is, is trying to connect those yeah. two things. So, so even the material objects, um, the, the patterns and colours are, are, are generated by a code. Yeah. So, for example, um, a lot of them use, um, in terms of the, 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 the colour patterns, just um, simple Markov chains um, yeah. to say, well, you know, which colour should come next and, you know, the probabilities of those and so forth, which is really kind of an interesting strategy for pattern generation. Um, um, so there's a lot of overlap between those two. Yeah. Um, so, but as to the pros and cons of each, I mean, I, I prefer the physical objects because of those, um, you know, kind of that way that it blends realities. Yeah. So you can say, well, okay, there's a marker. Um, I know that game exists here and I don't have to have the app open. Um, uh, so, uh, but of course, if you were to make an app that was, um, you know, playable worldwide, that's not so, so possible. Yeah. Yeah, so it's, yeah, pros and cons. Yeah. It depends on the scope of the project. Um, yeah. On that, on the kind of the same discussion, uh, the people that are playing this, are you finding they want to take away physical artifacts <laughs> from your game, or are they happy with how many have been stopped? Uh, <laughs> or yeah, are they yeah. happy with the digital things? And is that something you reconcile with, like what people can take away from it physically, as opposed to also just digitally? Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, it's interesting. Um, a couple of things uh, uh, kind of come into play there. For, well, the first game I made was in twenty ten. And it was for the city, city of Melbourne, it was a laneways commission. And um, they didn't want any digital technology. Uh, they said, oh look, you know, people won't be able to play it. Um, and you know, probably they were quite right, because even though you know, smartphones were ubiquitous, a lot of the you know, um, uh, uh, accessible uh, AR technologies and you know, things like that were, were not so kind of, um, uh, kind of uh, pervasive then. So, um, so that was really a game about physical collection. Um, and so I was talking the, kind of uh, about the, um, the different players, so we did the study of different players. One of the other players, um, who was hyper competitive, actually had a friend playing with him and he was, I mean, he wanted to rack up the highest score, but to do that he obviously had to collect all of these, all of these tokens, so he's got a huge collection of them. Um, um, I see him at every game now, mm. this guy, uh, Rob. And, um, um, but when he, he, he came in, uh, he lives in Melbourne, but he came in at, at the end of the Sydney game and effectively changed the score single-handedly or with, with his, his friend by running around the city, um, grabbing each marker but throwing it over his shoulder and his friend would put it into a backpack and then they just kind of claim them all really quickly. So he's, he's really into the collection um, and people do souvenir them. So um, for example, during Games Week, I was pretty much um, uh, what the kind of doing, doing a, a, a tour of all of the, the locations, 6 a.m. every morning to make sure that they all hadn't been taken. Tattersall's Lane, um, always. <laughs> people just always took, took that marker. Had to remake it five or six times. So yeah, I mean, this is the, the, the risk of public space, but also um, the, uh, I mean, that's, um, uh, I think that's, that's also a good thing. Um, it, 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 apart from the extra work that it, that, that it creates, it also, um, is another way that the, the kind of work is becoming embedded in, in the world, even if it's not. Uh, and, and, you know, the, 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 it depends on location. Um, the ones from Ars Incognita, the project I did with Vince Eakin uh, a year back, there's still, I think, um, two markers um, just in really out of the way locations. Um, uh, and those ones, uh, are because of this problem, they were actually put up with liquid nails, so um, by, not by me. Um, <laughs> Uh, so uh, they really had people had to really work to take them off. So yeah, it, it is both a problem and, and um, uh, I guess an opportunity for, for people.
And uh, could you describe more about your like philosophy or perspective about urgency? Because like for me, this is very long seems very playful, but also kind of quite deep. For, like I thought that so like because uh, like modern urban cities, everything is fragmented and you know disconnected. So you try to to you know like reconstruct as like his memory of the city or whatever. I think like. You have a kind of like phenomenological like philosophy or richer, so it's just so it sounds quite deep. So could you describe more about this concept? Yeah, sure. So I mean, there's a few levels to that. Um, one is this idea of urban code making it as a, as a tool um, for uh, um, decoding the city. So and that's something that um, I think uh, there's. Uh, to actually make that operational in, in a really in a very real sense, something that needs a lot more work in, in terms of um, how you formalize something like that because it's a big task. Mm -hmm. um, but it, so establishing it as a framework for that is, is one thing. Um, the second layer um, uh, is that is, is this aspect of wayfinding and, and what that does to um, uh, what, what that establishes in terms of people's understanding of or, or experience of place. So one of the um, aspects uh, that certainly uh, is prevalent in, in modern cities is, is alienation. You know, the, the city is often, um, I mean, we we're kind of a bit spoiled in Melbourne, um, but if you go out of the CBD, there's you know, a lot of spaces that are kind of hugely alienating. Actually, you just need to go to Docklands. But, um, <laughs> uh, and, and so you kind of that, that, that um, sense of, of disconnection, which is a, a social problem, right? Um, so in terms of people not feeling connected to the space, that, that they're living in um, or that they're working in or whatever it might be. And so um, play is, and, and making cities playable is, is definitely a way to increase you know, societal well-being in terms of overall. So I mean, a lot of people talk about you know, Pokemon Go, I'm getting fit or, or just I, I walked for the first time. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, but um, actually I think there's kind of um, bigger um, opportunities here. And, but I don't know, it's, it's really hard because you know, a lot of the smart cities rhetoric is, is just super utopian. And mm -hmm. for me, especially given what's happened this year, there's this dystopian side that, you know, so it's kind of reconciling those two things that, yeah, I think playable cities are, are a good thing and they, they can uh, kind of create that sense of change. And that's why I'm interested in that idea of, you know, making the world more fluid and mutable um, because it creates a better sense of connection with the, with the world around you. Um, uh, but then there's also just the the, the idea of uh, uh, you know uh, kind of play itself as, as an activity, um, um, which is also contentious because you know we see play in games as a, as a trivial thing, but actually, um, and this is what the serious games kind of um, well, used to be called the movement. Because people make serious games now. You know, trying to do. Um, but um, like we were talking about before, sometimes it's just too serious and you lose that, that kind of playful element, which is when you start to lose, and this is you know, this coming back to this key idea, if you're asking kind of philosophically where this is positioned, about reimagining or reontologizing reality. You know, saying, well, okay, things don't have to be the way that they are. They can, there are other possibilities. There are other, uh, other ways to see the world, other ways to be in the world, which is, um, you know, going back to the situationists and, and um, new games movement and, and so forth, a, a kind of subversive act. So play is not just playful, it's actually a subversive kind of act in, in that it's um, saying, well, I, I'm actually not going to accept this on uh, this kind of city at face value. I'm going to either you know, kind of decode its infrastructure or I'm going to try and connect with it in a new way or just reimagine an alternate city or you know, see that the city is not um, this is what in the, the Zydney project, the Sydney project, we looked at the ongoing processes of colonisation. Um, uh, so seeing the city not as a fixed kind of um, kind of uh, system or place, or um, but the fact that it is constantly changing, um, e even if it's changing at a slower rate than perhaps you know what we might be familiar with. So it's trying to make those kinds of processes um, tangible or, or overt. You're saying, well, the city is not always going to be this way. It's changing um, and no one person has control over that. Um, and perhaps you don't have any influence over it, but an awareness of it helps. Thank you. When, the, um, when, you, when you had the different um, groups, like Renew and stuff, did you see any behaviours sort of 
pull out of that? Like, because they were trying to influence certain locations and and develop this sort of um, whether renewing the city or taking it back. Um, did you see any sort of groups forming or any particular ideas or anything? I yeah yeah. So I always encourage that. Um, the uh, on uh, in Wayfinder Live. Um, there, there was some discussion or kind of people started to make hashtags or at least one hashtag which was Team Remake um, so which kind of started to, to kind of uh, spark off you know um, but because that was quite a short game um, there wasn't as much discussion as I would like in the, the, the uh, Melbourne and Sydney games there was a lot more discussion around oh what do these different things mean and, um, in, and in Sydney for example we the um, Game was staged in such in such a way as to create a community in the because it was also at Isia um, when it was in Sydney to create a community in the three months leading up to the game and then when the kind of uh, a festival or symposium started um, a different group of players came in so it was deliberately staged conflict and so people started to say oh you know we've got to fight for our team we've got to fight for our faction mm -hmm. um, uh, I guess in um, taking it if you could take it into a more of a serious games type context and invite that kind of discussion about, oh, you know, what does the city mean? What does, you know, this place mean? And, and those kinds of things. And um, uh, I'd be interested in, in that, um, you know, kind of working with an urban planner or somebody doing research into, into to urban planning and applying the game to that context. Yeah. Um, how many cities in Australia is it is Adelaide and Sydney and Melbourne? Yes. Yeah. So yeah. Could, could you you talked about decoding the urban infrastructure? What, what was kind of different? How you approach those um, projects differently in each city? Yeah. Sure. So um, so the, the the narrative, for example, in Melbourne was about around the hodl grid. So it was around, um, but also around the laneways. So one one feature that um, is quite kind of well, once you have it pointed out to you, it's really, really kind of obvious about you know that that kind of core of the Melbourne CBD is well, yes, it's on a grid, um, but it has all of these, or they're, they're slowly kind of being kind of decreasing as, as the kind of development takes over. But all of these small spaces in between, which was um, uh, established, um, well, uh, and there's a real tension there between design and and uh, kind of the overt urban planning, and just kind of the, the, I guess we might call it emergent systems that happen through through the use of the city. Hoddle grid was planned, people made that, the laneways emerged um, through, oh, we need to get supplies to this, you know, kind of textiles uh, kind of shop or we need to get people down to this place and all those kinds of things. So the, the none, none of those laneways were designed, they kind of emerged through through need. Um, so that was a really interesting thing about, about Melbourne. And also um, another thing that came up in the more, more recent game is, um, People started calling Melbourne the, the world's most playable city because mm -hmm. because it is. Um, I mean, it, it, it kind of all of those things I was talking about in terms of, you know, oh, let's allow street art, let's allow you know funky cafes, let's allow crazy expensive restaurants that are hidden in places that you usually you know, yeah. go down this lane where you usually get killed. <laughs> and, <laughs> um, um, uh, that all is kind of celebrated in Melbourne. It's part of the economy. It's part of the, the kind of system. So that that's really kind of an obvious aspe aspect. Um, in comparison to Sydney, which is much more um, uh, kind of uh, uh, kind of uh, disconnected locations. So, for example, in Sydney we had three locations: um, Darlinghurst, Chatswood, and Newtown, and um, pretty much three different player communities. So, um, players would play in Darlinghurst, but they wouldn't go to Chatswood. Um, likewise, all of those different locations. So, we had kind of different um, spaces emerge, which is really something to do with uh, how the city of Sydney operates. Um, of course the narrative there, which we couldn't, couldn't not address um, the colonial history, which is much more overt in Sydney than, than it is in Melbourne, a very different history as well. Adelaide, um, uh, I mean much smaller city um, and um, really actually quite hard to find the location. So while the system we, we game was originally designed in um, uh, um, you know, Melbourne was a hugely distributed event in Adelaide, it was based around a central hub, um, so it had to kind of be this satellite. Uh, so I had to have a, a core to, to situate it because the city itself was much more, uh, you know, I mean, there's, there's of course, um, you know, the main street, um, but then everything else is just 
you know, kind of scattered. It's very, very different. It's just kind of like peters out. Yeah. So quite different. But I mean, this is the, I guess, um, where I'm taking this research at the moment is, is um, maybe the system is at a stage where it could be overtly applied to that type of research. Um, and say, well, okay, um, given the right application of, of this system, you could find out things about your city that you don't know. Mm -hmm. um, if you're from an urban planning point of view or you know, smart cities point of view or whatever it might be. Yeah. yeah so I felt Ingress brought um, the physical world into the virtual world by letting users add locations, which yep. was dynamic in a way, but also static in the sense that those locations were relatively set. And then in a similar way, geocaching, which is a primarily physical game was dynamic because you could achieve that um, using the whole world as the game space because people were putting their own creations and hiding in different places. So I was thinking, what are some possibilities for a more dynamic physical world in the ga in games? Yeah, sure. So I mean, geocaching is a great example, and also the fact that it um, just uses things that already exist. So you know. Um, you know, hidden treasure boxes and GPS coordinates um, to create, and then the the game or, or how people play that emerges through a whole bunch of social rules, such as you know, you take one item, you put one item in, and all of those kinds of things, which are which are quite interesting. Um, uh, other possibilities for, for this type of gameplay, it really depends on what the space affords, I guess, and that's where I think um, you know the um, possibilities of you know, uh, smart cities perhaps open up opportunities. So if you're able to, I don't know, um, uh, use big urban screens to, to you know, uh, you know, I mean, obviously it's problematic in terms of moderating content, but um, to influence those in some ways. Um, so you're kind of working with, you know, big, big presence or, or playing with lighting or the idea of, um, I've been working with um, Bluetooth beacons a lot, so the uh, idea of kind of having um, nodes around the city that allow you know for a kind of a more passive tracking of, of people who might be playing the game and responding to those. So, for example, node that talks back and all these kinds of possibilities. So, kind of geocaching with some location uh, locational awareness, I guess, um, would that kind of would be a way to look at that. So, there's, yeah, there's lots of lots of possibilities, um, uh, and I guess. If if um, you know if we're going to you know, have all of this infrastructure in cities, um, fun, it's really just finding a way to play with it. Um, uh, there's um, a guy doing research at, at um, RMIT, for example, who who made a game on trams. Um, so was, you know, so using the the fact that people are waiting in a tram um, to you know, play a physical game in the tram, um, so from one end to the other, so connecting strangers in that kind of spaces. So whole bunch of different spaces that play can be made possible. Okay, I think we're, we're, oh, we're over time. Uh, oh, time. Perfect. Perfect. Thank you, Troy, so much for coming and for a great talk. Thanks. All right. Thank you.